Hi everyone, how are you? My name is Jennifer Conturis and today I will be moderating the panel on Mika. Uh, I know Mika is the favorite topic of everyone here and in the industry, so uh, we're going to be diving deep into it and trying to understand it as much as possible and how it affects the industry. Uh, with me I have Artur and Yarek, uh, and I would invite you guys to introduce yourselves quickly. Yarek, you go first. Uh, I'm Jarek Nowatski. Uh, happy to see you here. I'm uh, with three layers lawyers on the stage. I'm really happy that uh, anyone is still in the room. But I guess you know, in the coming months and years, uh, it will turn up that we, we are really needed. And uh, I'm, ja I'm Jarek. I'm a uh, um, co-founder of Tab Legal, which is a law firm. Uh, I'm also vice president of Pointer Capital, which is private equity venture capital uh, firm. And um, uh, I've been uh, in the industry since 2009. I've, I used to work for the Polish Financial Supervision Authority. I work for the bank, for the investment fund management company, investment firm. And since 2016, I'm uh, mostly providing services for payment uh, institutions, so fintech industry. In terms of crypto, I'm an investor, and I'm also used to be a contributor to, to the XDAO as legal counsel. I co-created co co um, the association of uh, crypto lawyers called Blockchain Lawyers Group. Uh, which now consists of uh, more than 100 lawyers from around the world. And uh, yeah, so that's me. Hi, my name is Artur Bielski. Uh, today I represent uh, Binance as a senior legal counsel. Obviously, a usual disclaimer that all the opinions that I give are on my own, nothing that I say is legal advice, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is a regulatory panel, so uh, hopefully it would not be boring to you, but because you're here, I guess that you're interested in it. And uh, yeah, when it comes to uh, my experience, I'm attorney at law in crypto since 2017. Um, started with uh, Ramp Network as one of the first employees. Before that, much like Yarek, I worked for the traditional finance, so banks, also law firms, things like that. Uh, right now, happily advising uh, Binance when it comes to mostly C region, but also fiat services. And yeah, that's me. Lovely. And a few words f about me. Um, my name is Xenophon Conturis. I work for a NADBA. NADBA is an association created by the Commission to ensure that we represent the industry as much as possible and as well as possible to all conversations that have to do with finance, which is my expertise, as well as other blockchain based applications. Um, so I guess we should start by explaining what Mika is. Um, a quick question for the room. Who here is a lawyer? One person, two people. The others are scared. There's more, of course. Um, and who here has actually started Mika this far? A couple of people. Uh, have you heard positive things about Mika? Have you seen positive things or negative things about this regulation thus far? Positive. Right? So it's a pretty good first step for the industry. But what does Mika entail? Well, first thing first, you need to understand that Mika was written in 2019. Um, 2019 was a long time ago for our industry. That is very fastly paced. Now, it was also written before the DeFi summer. So that's very important for us to understand where we are with the regulation and what it does. Specifically, Mika, and please correct me if you think I'm wrong or you want to add anything else. Um, defined crypto assets, defined crypto asset service providers, uh, created a framework for any public placing of crypto assets or selling of crypto assets and public raising, and <clears throat> defined stable coins in two different methods, as well as set requirements for stable coins in the industry. Uh, am I forgetting anything else? Maybe it's worth mentioning that the, the, the first intention was to, to tackle somehow the, 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 the Libra project by Facebook. So that was the, I think that the beginning, that was the, the, the main issue that uh, EU authorities wanted to, um, to address. I, I would state that it was Mika, the biggest thing that they addressed, as well as the ICO craze of 2017, 2018. Because of course, you see that much of what is in Mika is about defining who these people are and how they raise money and what they need to en ensure um, that they provide to their customers when it comes to disclosures, et cetera, et cetera so that they can raise money effectively and legally. Um, they also talked a little bit about NFTs. Do you want to add anything else? Uh, yeah, just one thing that uh, uh, reading Mika gave me a very strong deja vu feeling because uh, a lot of what's inside is 
pretty similar to some of the regulations that are already on the market. And by those regulations, I mean, for example, uh, prospectus regulation for financial instruments, uh, MIFID directive also for financial instruments, uh, uh, MAR regulation, so market abuse regulation also for, for financial instruments, by the way, and payment services directive. So it's not like it's something entirely new. I mean, it is in a sense, but at the same time, European regulators, European legislators, based very strongly on what's already existing on the financial market. So I think that Mika, in a sense, tries to mimic what we already have. And since you are mentioning about that and existing regulations, it's very important to mention that any crypto asset that is attached to a security is not in the scope of Mika. Tokenizing any sec or securitizing anything is not part of Mika, it's part of MIFID II, which is the financial regulation that has been applied to the European Union as a directive, actually, for quite some time. And I think it's also very important to mention a bit more about what a CASP is, a crypto asset service provider. Mika defines a CASP as the provision of custody and administration of crypto assets on behalf of third parties, the operations of a trading platform of crypto assets, the exchange of crypto assets for fiat currency that is legal tender, the exchange of crypto assets for other crypto assets, the execution of orders for crypto assets on behalf of third parties, the placing or offering of crypto assets, the reception and transmissions of orders for crypto assets on behalf of third parties, and providing advice on crypto assets. So the marketing panel before us might want to take note uh, in the near future. Um, of course, we can talk a bit more about that, but I just want to let you guys intervene and provide any feedback so far about the scope and anything that might be missing from these services. Well, it's also worth mentioning what is not included, yeah, and what the general approach taken in Mika is in relation of what's left outside. So we already mentioned that uh, these are the, the investment instruments and the securities, so everything that is already covered by financial regulations uh, in, the, in Europe. But uh, what, uh, what Mika also mentioned is that this aim of decentralization. Yeah, it mentions that uh, it does not aim to uh, to cover uh, the crypto asset services uh, when they are fully decentralized. Of course, the, the problem, but I, maybe for, for today I would say the opportunity, uh, is that is, of course, it's, uh, um, it would have to be um, decided what is really uh, the centralized uh, crypto asset service, what it is not. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, it leaves the, the full decentralized entities outside. So potentially the DAOs in this uh, purely anarchistic uh, way that we consider them uh, should be left outside. Uh, but at the same time, the entities that call themselves, uh, themselves DAOs, that control uh, protocols, that control uh, blockchain, that control access points uh, to this, and uh, even though they call themselves uh, DAOs, would still be covered uh, by Mika as crypto asset service uh, providers. And what's also not included are uh, non NFTs, yeah, non 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 um, non fungible um, uh, tokens, uh, but only if they not, do not resemble the securities. So, uh, so do, so in fact, when, when uh, only when they are not fungible. Yeah, that's a very interesting to uh, topic, and uh, uh, I smile right now because I've read a uh, hundred times that uh, Mika is uh, revolutionizing market of tokenized assets. And that's not exactly the case. I mean, uh, of course, when you uh, take uh, an initial glance at uh, what Mika offers, you will find the so-called ARTs, so asset reference tokens. And when you hear this term for the first time, you may have an impression that we are talking about tokenized assets, like uh, those used for investments. And uh, it's not exactly the case. In fact, ARTs are the types of stable coins. So if we want to uh, tokenize assets for investment purposes and not just keeping a value, a stable value of a token, I don't really think that Mika would help us. And uh, if you later, if you later remember anything from this panel, I think it's, uh, it can be uh, one of the key topics that, uh, uh, something what Jarek mentioned before, that uh, those assets that may be classified as financial instruments because, of, because they are, for example, tokenized debt or they are tokenized assets for the purpose of uh, investments, uh, that may be uh, quite, uh, quite, quite a key thing because uh, 
Um, the fact that we have MICA doesn't mean that we cannot fall under different regulations, like for example MIFID, the infamous MIFID. And um, also we need to remember that MICA is not the first regulation, at, le at least not first European regulation, that refers to virtual assets. We also have uh, MLD, so Anti-Money Laundering Directive. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that the definition of crypto assets is a little bit different if we take a look at MICA, because for Anti-Money Laundering Directive, uh, virtual asset is basically uh, any right or value that can be stored electronically and is used for exchange. Um, and for Mika it's a little bit different because uh, Mika only refers to value or rights that are uh, stored on, uh, use, uh, stored and can be transferred uh, using uh, either blockchain or uh, other distributed ledger technology. So uh, sometimes tokens can, can be classified as crypto assets under Mika and at the same time not being classified under anti-money laundering directive, they can be classified as virtual assets for both purposes or they can be neither. So it's uh, kind of tricky and uh, uh, you better ask your lawyer if you're unsure what you're talking can be. Absolutely. And listen, I think we should get to the gist of the conversation now, right? Because I think we've defined a bit about who we are and what we do. We've defined um, what Mika does and what the scope and aim is. Um, so how does that affect a centralized exchange or a centralized player? And I'm going to start with our two first. And I'm going to ask you the same question for decentralized players, Jarek, afterwards. Uh, okay, so uh, of course, uh, one thing that I want to uh, also uh, mention, and uh, I think it can be quite good takeaway, that uh, typically people think that Mika will affect exchanges, and it will, of course. It's it already uh, affects us, but uh, at the same time it can affect everyone. Because, uh, just as mentioned before, for example, uh, even a regular crypto advice would be a licensed entity. So uh, I can imagine that you know, YouTubers talking about crypto would have to apply for a license, which can seem quite crazy, but you know, it is what it is. Um, and uh, not only them, also regular people, like uh, all the investors that uh, engage in uh, crypto activity, that uh, um, buy and sell crypto will be affected too. Uh, I think we'll talk about it later, but uh, uh, one of the things that uh, Mika also introduces is uh, um, rules of preventing market manipulation and market abuse. So. Uh, yeah, no longer, uh, no more pumps and dumps. But yeah, when it comes to exchanges, I think the well, and also issuers, of course, it's because issuers, like for example, issuers of stable coins, but of other cryptocurrencies as well, we have to publish uh, um, information documents, like white papers that would be uh, quite similar to prospectuses. But uh, answering the question finally, I think that uh, uh, for exchanges, the main uh, challenge. Is to will be to obtain a license simply, but uh, I wouldn't even call it a problematic. In fact, in my opinion, um, all of the major players were waiting for it because uh, uh, it's uh, kind of difficult to operate in uh, um, in a legal environment this uns that's uncertain that you are like left in a gray area somewhat, and uh, because. Um, Mika introduces this licensing regime and authorization. It can, of course, be difficult to obtain a license. You would have to submit a lot of documents. You would be subject to uh, certain regulations. Uh, uh, smaller entities may have problems doing that. But at the end of the day, it would provide uh, a lot more safety. Um, also, uh, more safety for the clients, especially, but more certainty on the market. So I think that the outcome would be positive at the end of the day. Yarek, would you agree? And how would that affect the startup trying to build a DAO and other DAOs that might be already active as Mika? Do you think it affects them or not really? Yes, I'm, 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 go I'm st still trying to, to, to be like mostly positive. Uh, so in case of, of DAOs, in case of decentralized exchanges and in general, in case of decentralized finance and DeFi, uh, I would say this is an opportunity. 
uh, I would say that Mika does not uh, directly address the issue by either prohibiting or forcing uh, DEXs or, or DAOs to, to, to become authorized. Uh, additionally, um, uh, MICA also uh, already uh, ordered the further works of the European Commission and supervisory authorities in relation to the centralized finance. So it's good that the, re that the regulators are, uh, are were aware of that, uh, uh, that uh, DeFi is, is, uh, is just uh, the topic that should be treated in a different way. And uh, I believe in that in, in, in case of, of, of DAOs, in case of DEXs, it will, but especially in case of DAOs, it will force uh, those that's, that stand behind them to, read, to, to decide, you know, whether this is uh, like the, this is the, the, the project that uh, that in fact is not decentralized and in fact it's just controlled by the by the by one particular company, which would mean that they would simply become um, covered by by Mika. They would be forced to to obtain the authorization, which is not a bad thing. And I agree uh, with Arthur, especially in case of, of certain like, um, treatment of certain certain clients so by certain DAOs. Decentralize or die, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what what we uh, what what I what I would say. So, uh, like from the from this like anarchistic side of me, I I really look forward to seeing you know how. Uh, those certain entities will try to like to, to, to find their niche, but outside of still being to, to be still outside of the re regulatory regime. So, which is might be um, strange thing for me to say as a lawyer, because I earn my living like from from organizing, or obtaining licenses, etc. But yeah, but this is what I believe in, and this is what I look forward, and and, and this is what I'm really excited about. Thank you very much. Now, I do want to open up for Q and A very very soon, but I have one to ask you. What do you think the future holds? And do you have any closing thoughts about Mika and the future regulations in Europe? Well, maybe I can, I can say that there, there's an opportunity, yeah? because I, uh, I, I come, of course, from the traditional finance. So, but I remember uh, working with fintechs uh, and, and meeting people from, from the fintech world even before the PSD. Which is the payment services directive, yeah. and to, to some, to a certain degree, uh, the, the the world of payment services was a little bit uh, kind of wild west, yeah, because it was outside of of the banking regulations. Uh, it was not that governed, but governed. Uh, and uh, I remember when the PSD two was was introduced. Uh, there were certain certain uh, actors from the from the market saying that uh, it's going to totally uh, destroy the market, uh, that the banking uh, sector will will take over uh, all the payment uh, payment services. But uh, after you know after this uh, all these years, we can see you now that uh, that this was indeed an opportunity. And I, I can say as well that it's not that hard to really to, to obtain the, the license. It's not that hard, you know, to, to have those rules written, and 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 uh, and it's not that hard to stick to them. So for me, it's an opportunity, and it's also an investment opportunity. As as a um, uh, as a VP at Pointer Capital, I see it as an op investment opportunity because you know the European Union would be the market which has like the, the highest level of, of, um, of, of, of the regulation, which is also good when you want to spend your money and you don't want to have that money seized by the government, which is, for example, happening right now in the US. So, that's my opinion. Yeah, so as for me, uh, if you guys are interested in Mika, I can uh, recommend, and you speak Polish, uh, I can recommend the book uh, Meta Świat. I'm one of the authors. Um, it's pretty cheap, I think. Last time I checked, it was like 10 zlotys or something uh, in the internet. And there is uh, a chapter that I wrote about Mika that basically sums it up. So if you're interested, I can. I think I can recommend. Um, closing thoughts. Um, I guess there is a lot to discover when it comes to Mika, because people often forget that uh, um, that certain provisions of uh, this regulation would affect and change the business in a way that wasn't seen before. Like, I can give you just two examples. One example is staking and uh, um, earning profit or interest, I shall say, on stable coins. Mika pro more or less prohibits that, so no more staking, sorry. Uh, the other thing uh, about me, at, at least not when it comes to ARTs and EMITs. Um, other thing that uh, is uh, uh, quite interesting um, is, um, well, market manipulation I've mentioned already, so, so maybe n no need to talk about it uh, uh, again. Um, but, uh, yeah, 
for, for example, for issuers, if we want to issue a token, right now it's kind of deregulated, um, on our unregulated, I should say, um, and most people talk about how Mika will influence that in the case of publishing white papers that would be subject to certain regulation. That's true. But people often forget about, for example, the right of withdrawal. So if you issue a token, uh, you would have to allow your investors to get their money back within 30, 30 days, if I remember correctly. So it would be a huge problem for a lot of issuers and uh, may change the way uh, the way the, the market uh, works right now, it may also change how uh, the marketing is done for such offers. Because uh, uh, right now, we often see uh, issuers uh, playing on emotions, things like that. And if you, uh, uh, there's FOMO, of course, things like that. But when you have 30 days to rethink and uh, withdraw the money that you paid for a token, it's a completely different story. Thank you very much. I also want to add just a couple of, of things on here. Remember, in the services that a CASP offers, staking, staking as a service and lending are not under CASPs. This is an omission that's going to be covered by Mika 2, which is discussed but not even planned yet. And we expect that Mika 2 is also going to touch upon DeFi, DAOs, NFT sales. And if these are a little bit in Mika, when they're used to fundraise money, you need to have a white paper and some of these requirements. Um, but I, have, I want to open up for Q&A in just a second, but I want to ask you guys quickly. Would you put your money into an exchange that is licensed under Mika or an exchange that's not licensed under Mika? Um, just quickly, one word answer, regulated or unregulated? I would, I would do both, I guess. <laughs> I, would, I think I would still, I would still stick to, to the centralized entities, but you know, in, in terms of like general, general use, I, I, would, I, I would favor the, the Mika regulated uh, entity. I would, like, I would just like to have my, like to know that my funds are, not, are, not, are separated from the company's funds. I would be, I would be grateful that, you know, that, uh, that in, in, in case of, of the communication, there's actually someone liable for what is being put in the in the white paper, so uh, yeah, so I, I guess you know a lot of, of us may 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 may, may, may were um, uh, victims of, of shilling, etc. So I guess you know in case of Mika regulated entities, this is less probable. Still still pro possible, but like I guess less probable. Yeah, license central exchanges. Whatever uh, answer did you expect me to give? <laughs> And we know Mika is going to be implemented by the end of 2025. Would you issue a token now or after 2025? Well, I can say, you know, that the people, the clients of my law firm, they, they, they do not wait for, the, for, for, for Mika to be enacted because, you know, the, the business ma ma must go on and uh, so no one is really waiting. But, uh, but it's smart to know what is coming. Yeah, it's smart to, 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 to know what to expect and uh, not to be surprised, you know, in two years, uh, and and then uh, not to have to like prepare all those documents, do the authorization, and and do everything. So I I, I guess you not know, smart 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 people from the market. They they just start to you know to to, uh, to prepare themselves for the for for Mika. I think it all depends on who's your target base. If you want to sell your tokens in East Asia, you don't really care about Mika, right? And it's something that people often forget. Forget, Like, for example, they register the company in Switzerland and say, oh, okay, I'm in Canton Zug, I can't do anything, I don't care. It's not really like that, because Mika follows the clients. Each time you would offer your tokens to clients from the European Union, you would have to meet the requirements that are provided by the regulation. So. Yeah, if you uh, if your uh, if your client base if you're, well client base if you want to sell your tokens in the European Union, and you as an issuer think that it would be difficult for you to meet the requirements, you don't want to bear the additional cost and you don't need uh, additional credibility. It's better to offer now. But if you want your token to be more credible, let's say, you may very well wait. But as we can see on the market, it's. Uh, not only about legal things, but also how market works. If we, right now we're in a um, bear market, everyone knows that maybe it's better to wait for a bull market to uh, 
to issue your tokens, not because of legal things, but because of better valuations, because of more market participants, because of more optimism on the market. So I don't think that at the end of the day, uh, legal issues would, will be, they will be important, but they will not be the key factor that would decide on the timing of uh, the issuance. Thank you. So questions. Uh, we have two questions. Yeah, I think that we have uh, time for both. I mean, we don't have, but uh, uh, <laughs> let's be quick. Thanks. Um, I, I just wanted to, to let you know that uh, I think I'm one of the only representative of Crypto Valley in Zug here, I think. And we, we, we do have regulation in Switzerland as well. So you cannot, yeah, I know. Do, you cannot do whatever you want out of Switzerland. So it's a if you are a Swiss company and you are selling to European citizens, you need to be complied with Mika. So you need to have a license and, and in also, Europe. Also in Switzerland, you you have to do. Um, okay. So it's it's even worse. If you place your company in Switzerland, you would have to meet the Swiss regulations. And after that, if you offer your tokens to the clients from the European Union, you have to meet regulations of the European Union. So double trouble, basically. But yeah, sorry, I know that, uh, in fact, I think that Zurich and Switzerland as such has uh, one of the best regulations in the world when, when, it, comes to, when it comes to blockchain and new technologies. I, uh, I, I wouldn't like, uh, I, I, my intention wasn't to mock anyone. I, I, what I wanted to say is that uh, in Zurich, regulations are crypto friendly. In European Union, not so much. And uh, uh, a lot of people think that if they register in one country, like, I don't know, it can be Seychelles, it can be, uh, I don't know, Bolivia, Aztec Empire, Antarctica, you name it, any jurisdiction. And uh, it doesn't mean that you can ignore all the other jurisdictions where you um, offer your tokens. It's also st uh, worth noting that uh, EU customers would still be able to access the crypto services from, uh, from third countries, but uh, the only problem would be to market them into the EU. So that's the case. But you know, the, if someone is using, already using it, it and, and, and wishes to, to, to use additional crypto service from uh, outside of the uh, European Union, it will would, it would still be possible. Yes, exactly. And no offense, apologies are, you know, if I offended anyone, it was my intention. Cool, thank you. So on my side, one question in relation to DeFi. I know that DeFi is not covered by Mika, uh, but you mentioned that staking stable coins would be illegal or impossible uh, in the future in the European Union. Do you want to go? So I, my general question is like, um, how do you see regulations affecting DeFi um, in the future? Well, like KYC, AML, what, what would be the expressions of regulation on, De on DeFi? I can, I, I can uh, answer in relation to, to, to Mika. So Right now, the, the Mika's approach is that uh, when, um, in case of you know, in case of, of staking, it depends of, of really what kind of program we are we are talking about because you know the, the the market term staking sometimes covers different things. So the one thing is, for example, the, the you cannot earn interest, right? Yeah, yeah. For example, the Mika prohibits um, uh, obtaining interest on stable coins. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, it allows uh, to issue uh, tokens um, um, as a kind of reward for. Uh, for the tokens that you already provide, so so for example, this is this is okay, and this is like this is in accordance with uh, with current version of Mika. In, in legal words, matter. So the way that you market your interest as a reward or airdrop is going to help you become compliant. Um, and also, we didn't touch upon many other regulations, right? So the AMLR, a regulation on AML, which increases the requirements from AML. AML AML D5, which is what we had to deal with in 2017-2018. Uh, there's also DAC8, which is going to tax or present a framework for taxing crypto assets. Um, and ultimately, we are maturing as an industry, and this is going to allow us to achieve many other things and make a lot of money, hopefully, doing it. So yeah, just keep it positive in my mind. Yeah, I, think that's, I think that's time. I, I yeah. think, yeah, I think maybe. that we need to uh, just one finish now. Just one sentence, maybe. I think that for DeFi, the most important part of Mika is EMT, EMT so e-money tokens, because they would uh, um, be the new e-money. Great. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for our guests. And, uh,